What Nicholas is, uh, is going to give us here is um, uh, resolving the apparent conflict between land as common heritage and land as private property. So, would you like to that? When I heard that the International Union would be holding a conference on economics for conscious evolution, my immediate thought was, yes, I can contribute something to that. I'd like to contribute something to how our conscious evolution is going to deal with this conflict between the idea of land as everyone's common heritage and land as private property. Both have important roles in our society. We understand and we seek to lead others to understand that land is everyone's common heritage, that we all have equal rights to the earth. This understanding is central to our efforts to promote conscious evolution toward a world that truly works. When we try to persuade others that land is our common heritage, we often encounter a barrier. People tend to see land as private property. This prevents them from seeing land as everyone's common heritage. So, I propose to explore the foundations and the implications of both land as our common heritage and land as private property, and identify the desirable parts of both that are compatible with each other. Land as our common heritage has its origin in the idea that there are valuable natural opportunities that are not the product of anyone's efforts. Furthermore, human beings have an obligation to give equal respect to the wishes of all persons to appropriate for their own uses the scarce opportunities provided by nature. Thus, we have an obligation to share natural opportunities as our common heritage. The idea of equal rights to our common heritage in natural opportunities is not as simple as it may seem. It does not mean dividing the earth into equal parcels for everyone. This was relevant in China when everything was an agricultural economy. It's not the way to do things. Some people have neither the talent nor the inclination to take over their shares of the earth. Nor does equal rights to the earth mean that you all participate equally in some grand democratic process that decides the use of every parcel of ground. That would leave no scope for individual initiative. Now, if there were no scarcity of natural opportunities, then equal rights to natural opportunities would mean that every person was allowed to use natural opportunities in whatever ways he or she wished. The principle of equal rights to natural opportunities restricts what people may do only when actions by one person limit the ability of others to achieve their desires. But scarcity alone is not sufficient for the principle of equal rights to be applicable. There must also be less than perfect harmony. If natural opportunities were scarce, but everyone agreed on how they should be used, then whether the agreed allocation was equal or not, there would be no need to apply a principle of equal rights. If there is no disagreement, then there is no need to invoke equal rights. It might be tempting to think of a principle of equal rights as emerging historically when humans first began to grow in numbers to where some natural opportunities became scarce. But such a sequence is unlikely to have had any historical relevance. It seems much more likely that, we're, that there were scarcities of natural opportunities before and while our ancestors were becoming human. Our pre-human, partially human, and early human ancestors can reasonably be presumed to have dealt with resource scarcity the way animals typically do by driving off or killing competitors. Selection through aggression is one of the ways of nature. At the same time that early humans were presumably driving off and killing competitors, 
they would have been under natural selection pressure to cooperate with one another within groups for hunting and other forms of cooperative production, for child raising, and for, for more effective fighting against other groups. For many thousands of years, human success has entailed the combination of cooperation and sharing within a reference group and the opportunistic driving off, enslaving, or killing of outsiders who are not strong enough to resist. Thus, the idea of land as common heritage did not emerge as a way of dealing with the initial human experience of scarcity of natural opportunities. Rather, it emerged as a component of the moral evolution of humanity. When Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People felt the rightness of what he had written. The resonance of these words helped to end slavery and to produce a world where today virtually all civilized discourse presumes that women and minorities must be accorded the same civil and political rights as men of the ethnically dominant group in a society. That just isn't challenged. These are important achievements in moral evolution. This moral evolution has also begun to be understood to include a principle of natural opportunities as common heritage to which we all have equal rights. Now, a principle of equal rights is not the same as equality. Equal rights incorporates recognition of our individuality, the right of each of us to pursue happiness in whatever way he or she chooses. If we are not interfering with others, we may do as we wish, and we may cooperate with whom we choose in whatever activities are mutually agreed. A complication arises from the fact that one of the ways in which we often wish to cooperate with others is in the formation of communities that impose standards of conduct that have no obvious necessity. Why should we be able to specify the amount of clothing that our fellow citizens must wear in public, or how sober they must be in my community, you can be arrested for being drunk on the sidewalk. Or what pornography they may consume. From the perspective of equal rights to our common heritage, there is an answer. The answer is that we may impose all of these restrictions on others that we choose, because those of us who want to live in a community with such restrictions have a right to use our share of our common heritage to form the kind of community that expresses our idea of what a good community is. And here I'd like to depart from the text to give you my answer to the Michael Jordan question. My answer is that people who want to live in a society that tax the incomes of the highly productive people have a perfect right to form a society that does that as long as there are competing societies where anyone who doesn't like it can go and live where such incomes are not taxed. We have a right to exclude highly talented people or to make them pay for the exercise of talents if that's where we want to use our liberty to form communities. Those who don't like such restrictions can form their own communities somewhere else. Of course, this presumes that there is an actual opportunity for every dissenter to have a share of our common heritage on which to pursue his or her conception of the good. Thus, the idea of coming together by choice and choosing to separate when we cannot agree is an integral part of equal rights to our common heritage. But the right to form whatever kinds of communities people wish only makes sense if there is an adequate opportunity for those who disagree to lead. And it might happen that all of the space on Earth was already occupied by communities that had no interest in including the persons who wished to leave their present communities. Therefore, the idea of equal rights to our common heritage must include an understanding that a group who are unhappy with the rules of their community have a right to require that territory of the community be divided into a portion for those who are content with the rules of the community 
and a separate portion for those who wish to leave, live under a different set of rules. Equal rights to our common heritage means recognizing that dissatisfied minorities must have opportunities to live under the rules that they choose. To deny this opportunity is an unjustifiable tyranny of the majority. It is an example of land monopoly. Of course, splitting up communities will often mean losing economies of scale. That is a loss that is shared by all who cannot agree on a set of rules by which to live. It is the price of not agreeing and a stimulus to finding a compromise that all can accept. The principle of equal rights to our common heritage also has an important implication for justice among separate communities. A community's claim to control over territory that it occupies is justifiable only if one of the following two conditions is met. One, the value of the natural opportunities that the community uses is not disproportionately large in relation to the number of people in the community. Or two, the community provides compensation in the amount of the excess of its appropriation of national opportunities, natural opportunities, beyond the average that all can have. For those who have, so that we can have compensation for those who have disproportionately small shares of natural opportunities. Then the question arises as to how one determines whether a community has more than its share of natural opportunities. There can never be perfection in answering such a question. The most that can be achieved is an unbiased, serious effort. A community that wants to satisfy its obligation to respect the equal rights of all people to natural opportunities can hire an independent appraiser who would estimate the rental value of the natural opportunities appropriated by the community and the rental value of the rest of the natural opportunities on earth. Then, with the population of the community and that of the rest of the world and a bit of arithmetic, one can calculate an, an estimate of the amount by which the community's appropriation of natural opportunities exceeds or falls short of its share. If its estimated appropriation exceeds its share, a community that wanted to behave justly would pay into a fund to compensate the communities that had less than their shares. When counting the natural opportunities that a community appropriates, one would count such things as emissions of greenhouse gases and other things that pollute the air and water beyond its borders, and the community's appropriation of minerals, migratory fish and birds, fresh water that would be available to others if not appropriated, and the frequency spectrum beyond the borders of the community, and geosynchronous orbits. All resources would be evaluated by the estimated loss to the rest of the world from the fact that this community was appropriating these resources. When appraising the land occupied by a community, the relevant question would be, what would the rental value of the territory occupied the community, by the community be if there were no community here? The community would have no obligation to pay for the addition to the rental value of its territory from its infrastructure and development. To the extent that activities in the community raise the rental value of land elsewhere, this would count as a credit against its appropriation of natural opportunities. Then the question arises of whether an above average birth rate counts as an appropriation of natural opportunities. If a community has an above average birth rate, then in the next generation, the grown children of that community will have a claim on larger shares of resources than their parents had. Other communities will need to reduce their shares of global natural opportunities that they claim. Thus, there is a prima facie case for the proposition that having an above average birth rate represents an appropriation of natural opportunities that requires compensation. However, there are other considerations. A larger world population means lower costs for computer software, movies, books, and anything else for which average costs decline as output increases. It means more geniuses who benefit the world much more than they are, are ever compensated. It means a greater variety of associations with specialized interests. For all of these reasons, having a larger population produces benefits while also reducing per capita resources, so that it is not clear a priori 
whether the net effect of a larger population and average income in the world is positive or negative. It almost certainly depends on the level of world population. At low levels of population, the benefits can be expected to dominate, while at high levels, costs would dominate. So it is a question of empirical inquiry whether an above average birth rate is something for which a community should compensate or be compensated for. So let's review the foundations and implications of land as our common heritage. From the understanding that there are valuable natural opportunities that no one created, and all people are created equal so that we have an obligation to accord equal respect to the desires of all to use natural opportunities, there arises an obligation of individuals and communities not to appropriate a more valuable share of natural opportunities that, than others can also have. Natural opportunities includes not just land, but minerals, wild animals, water, the frequency spectrum, geosynchronous orbits, the capacity of their environment to absorb pollutants, and other harmful effects of communities on their neighbors, and potentially limited capacity of Earth to absorb more people without having levels of well-being fall. Because we want to live in communities that express our varying ideas about what a good community is, we have an obligation to allow our territory to be divided up when we are unable to agree with our fellow citizens on rules under which to live. These are challenging ideas, but they have the potential to provide a framework for a world that operates much more efficiently than the world we have. Now, I'd like to turn to land as private property. The word property shares an origin with the word proper, going back to the Latin word proprius, meaning one's own. The idea that what one produces is one's own, is one's property, serves the very important function of ensuring that people will have incentives to be productive. Animals appear to have only a rudimentary concept of property associated with protecting territory. It was a very important development in human evolution for the value of a person's efforts to be protected by a shared social concept of property. The idea that land that one occupies is one's property has at least two important social functions. First, because some things that people produce, namely structures, are highly immobile, having long-lasting control over locations serve to ensure that people are able to benefit from their investments in structures. Second, there is the idea that a man's home is his castle. <laughs> having a parcel of land as one's property gives expression to the idea that there is a place where a person can be the person he or she wants to be, to do the things that he or she wants to do where no one else is allowed to interfere. There is another consequence of land as private property that has an element of efficiency. This is the fact that giving ownership of a resource to the person who discovers it motivates people to discover resources that otherwise would go undiscovered and therefore unused. The trouble with this argument is that the reward is too great. Granting complete ownership to the discoverer motivates people to invest in excessively in discovery to try to ensure that they are first. Discovery is valuable, but to motivate efficient discovery, one must offer a reward of a size such that only the person with the lowest cost of discovery is motivated to put resources into discovery. Granting complete ownership to discoverers is not efficient. Economists sometimes make the argument that those who have land are only making normal returns on their investments. This is true, but this economic fact does not mean that the institution of private ownership of land produces better results than some other institutional arrangement under which one would also find economic agents making only ordinary returns on their investments. The fact that under competition, people make ordinary returns on their investments in land is not directly relevant to the question of what institutions are best. Then there is the psychological fact that people tend people tend to have a sense of entitlement to the things that they have, especially if they sacrifice something to obtain them. This aspect of human psychology is related to the phenomenon of territoriality in animals. Animals tend to be aggressive when territory they regard as theirs is invaded. People tend to become aggressive when the property they regard as theirs is threatened or when the economic opportunities they come to expect are no longer available. 
This psychological fact has implications for the cost and the political difficulty of achieving, of achieving reforms, but it does not affect the long-run value of reform. Summarizing the foundations and implications of private property in life, Property can be presumed to be evolved from its value in motivating people to be economically productive. Property in land makes it efficient for people to make investments that are attached to land, and it provides a place where people can exercise their individual liberty. Property rights and what finds creates an inefficient large incentive for discovery. In any competitive economy, people make normal returns on average on their investments, but this has no implication for the efficiency of institutions. Psychologically, people tend to become aggressively unhappy when the ownership of property or their other expectations of economic benefit are disappointed. So how are we going to resolve these? The apparent conflict between land as our common heritage and land as private property cannot be completely resolved, but substantial parts of it can. We cannot let people have complete ownership of indefinitely large amounts of land while also recognizing the equal rights of all to land as our common heritage. But we can recognize each person's right to a share of land and other natural opportunities. This recognition means that the idea of a man's home as his castle, the idea of a place where a person can exercise his liberty, can express his or her individuality, can pursue happiness in the way that he or she chooses is entirely compatible with land as our common heritage. In fact, to ensure that all persons have liberty, it is essential to ensure that each person has a right to a place where that liberty can be exercised. If some of the people have all of the land, there will no, be no place for others to exercise their liberty. A person's share of natural opportunities is the amount that every other person can also have. The addition to the rental value of land from infrastructure and economic growth of communities is not part of anyone's share. It is for the community to dispose of as it chooses. If a person wishes to have his share of natural opportunities in a place where infrastructure and the growth of the community add to the value of land, he should expect to pay that much of the rental value of the land he occupies to the community. If he wishes to have a smaller piece of land, his obligation to the community will shrink and perhaps even become negative. The benefit of private property and land in ensuring that people who build structures will benefit from those investments can also be obtained in a framework that recognizes land as everyone's common heritage. All that is needed is a continuation of the current system of land titles. The land title provides social recognition of the right of the title holder to decide how the land will be used into the indefinite future. If land is recognized as everyone's common heritage, then holding title land also carries an obligation to pay to the community the excess of the rental value of the land above a person's equal share of natural opportunities. This obligation does not interfere with the title holder's opportunity to benefit from any enduring improvements to the land that he or she has made. One might object. It could happen that a person builds a lasting improvement and then unexpectedly the rental value of the land rises because of the growth of the community. The rise in the value of the land and the corresponding rise in the rental value that the title holder must pay to the community could destroy the value of the improvement. Yes, this can happen. And the economic way of dealing with this risk is by having provide having improvers of land who are worried about it by insurance. An improvement is only truly worthwhile if it has a positive return when one includes in its cost the cost of insurance against a rise in land value that makes the improvement obsolete. It is not necessary for the holder of title to land to have a guarantee that taxes will not rise. Then there is the issue of efficient motivation of resource discoveries. It is difficult to devise a system that motivates people to spend efficiently on seeking to discover resources. Some compensation is appropriate. Full compensation of the resources that are found is excessive and motivates wasteful expenditures on discovery. Thus, 
it is possible to incorporate the most valuable aspects of land as private property into a framework that recognizes land as everyone's common heritage, a common heritage to which we all have equal rights. Thank you. Bill, so what do you think of my re reply with respect to Michael Jordan? If we really could have two societies, that's obviously well, a moot question. Okay. Well, okay. So let me elaborate on, on that. Are you aware of the description of taxation in Article One of the U.S. Constitution? Not off the top of my head. Yeah. It says that uh, taxes and uh, representation shall be apportioned among the direct taxation, oh, yes, 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 yes. and representation shall be accorded among, distributed among the states according to population. So my idea of an attractive tax system is one where the government, federal government levies no taxes, just assigns tax shares to states. Now, according to the Constitution, it ought to be according to population. What I say is start with that and then throw some extra money into the poor states if we have to live with the Constitution. Then the states should allocate these obligations to the counties. And the counties should have the, be the only ones who raise taxes. We should have 3,000 different entities deciding what kind of tax system they want. People move around. Right. <laughs> and any community that wants to tax as Michael Jordan's is free to do so, and they'll go live so somewhere else. There'll be some community where they will welcome, I'm sure. Yeah. I, have, I have still another misgiving, yes. though. My misgiving is a very practical problem about the United States using three and a half footprints of Earth and arguing that China should cut back on its smokestack yeah. industries. Yeah. Okay. And it's a, it's a synchronic rather than a diachronic projection. Yeah. Well, we, 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 need, we need to try to get, estimate what the right price is for carbon dioxide emissions. And we also have to estimate how much more than its share the U.S. is using so the U.S. can compensate others. Both of those things are necessary. Let me continue on the question of carbon dioxide for two minutes. Uh, if you look at the economic estimates of the cost of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the scientifically respectable est estimates range from $5 a ton to $95 a ton. That's quite a wide range, rather difficult to pick out what the right number is in that range of scientifically respectable estimates. I've published a suggestion of how we should proceed. What I think we ought to do is require anyone who wants to emit carbon dioxide to put down a deposit of $95 a ton. <laughs> and we give him a a credit for his deposit, and we say that in 30 years we'll figure out what the right price is and give you your change with interest. <laughs> and in the meantime, he takes this certificate and he sells it in the bond market. And the bond market then determines what they think we will think the right price is in 30 years. So we have the market deciding our, its best guess of what the best scientific guess will be in 30 years as the way to decide today how important it is to restrict carbon dioxide emissions. So, but once we'd figure out what the right amount is, I would apply it to China today. I'd say, you, at the, you are using, for, for all that you are emitting, you ought to be paying the rest of us, but it's more than your share. But you may well have your less than your share of other things, and you'd be using less than your share of reproduction opportunities and various other things. It all goes into the calculation. What? Well, what, what do we do about the, the, the decline of fish population? We, we, charge for fish we charge for fish taken out of the ocean. We charge for every reduction in resources according to the social cost of that reduction. Meanwhile, they're gone. Yeah, well, so we can't, we can't do anything about the past, but we, 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 we can do something about what, what's happening as soon as we are willing to do so. Ilana. No, your initial analysis. I get a little bit lost though when you're talking about private property and being able to do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. your castle. It's a very American idea. Um, I, uh, we think of it as a British idea. <laughs> well, in Ireland we don't think of it as a British idea. But um, the problem with that in a way, and I, and I see this division in uh, land tax areas in America mm -hmm. and Europe, is that I'm very much in favor of planning. As, as we 
Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, there is a cost on the community. Where yes. Individuals can do, can use their land as they wish. Yes. And I have, we have no, where people do that in a country, as in America, where broadly it's argued you can pay land value tax, there should be no, no other restriction on your land. As you say, you can get insurance for conditions where the, the uh, land value increases because of the activities of others. The problem is, others have to suffer the consequences of that, which is considerable yeah. costs in infrastructural services, yeah. in social capital yeah. development, in environmental impact, and in sheer ugliness. Yes. And so I feel that uh, people should be able to collectively, together decide uh, what is, relatively speaking, from an objective standpoint, engineering standpoint, what, what is the kind of land to take broadly, in other words, compact settlements. Okay. So I, I, and I think that is, that is completely consistent with land value taxation yes. and with uh, personal li liberty in the sense of being able to collectively agree with Well, I have several answers to you. One answer, I thought about this a lot, and in fact, if you ever find, if you ask me for my doctoral dissertation, which I wrote 35, 45 years ago, uh, You'll find some, some dealing with this, but you, you shouldn't have to wait for an answer. Um, one answer is that any community that wants to have planning should be free to have planning, and those that don't want to have planning should be free not to have planning. Another answer is that if you look at where planning has, been oper has operated, one of the consequences of planning has tended to be a severe restriction on the possibility of anybody doing anything, a severe underuse of land. And so if you're going to have planning, I would like to see planning done in a way that doesn't have this unfortunate economic consequence. I would propose a form of planning, well, what I proposed in my dissertation, was a system where if anybody wants to make a change, he offers an amount of money that he's prepared to pay for permission to make the change, and you have the neighbors who are affected by the change of vote on whether the compensation is sufficient. Now, I don't know if that's the best way to try to evaluate proposed changes. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't uh, satisfy, well, I, I would guess that it sounds bizarrely uh, market-oriented to you. Uh, but I guess what I, I would say is that systems of majority rule, of democratic process, uh, tend to not be sufficiently flexible to incorporate the variety of things that are humanly possible, or humanly interesting. So I think it is very important to make sure that people who cause harm pay for the harm that they cause. Whether you want to go with that and prohibit them from doing things uh, is to me is quite suspicious. And I guess I would say that the only kinds of prohibitions that seem to me consistent with my idea of attractive liberty are ones that apply to everybody. In other words, if you're going to let anybody do something, you should let everybody do it. You should make everybody pay for the harm that's caused by doing it. Whenever you have a system that lets some people do it and not others, that privilege, that right of some people to do what others are not allowed to do, uh, undermines the kind of equal justice that is attractive to me. Well, just to come back on that, do with your land what you would like to do if you don't own land or sufficient land. So some people in Ireland own, a land of widely known in Ireland, but some people own more than others. Yes. So only they are in a position, in other words, yes. to grow. And the individuals who are living in the urban situations and where there is a net and will always be a net transfer of taxation, whether it's through income tax or even the land value tax, from the urban area to the rural area can't affect, can't, yeah. okay. under your scheme of things, limit those who are privileged in owning more land yeah. in a certain well, location. So in, it's not acceptable. In, in, my view, in my scheme of things, uh, any community that wanted to organize itself properly would charge uh, a level of uh, required payments for land that would make the selling price of land zero so that everybody could have as much land as was prepared to pay the taxes on. I would entirely wipe out 
land as a source of individual wealth. I know, okay. That would be nice. But we're, we're working now from a situation where we mostly have income taxes, progressive taxes, yes. transaction taxes, and some property taxes. Yes. And we're trying to live okay. So you, you are talking about what it... We start from the beginning. So we, so we have to more or less deal with this well. scenario. And, and it's a political question. Yeah. Well, let me, it's let me, a political question starting from now. Yeah. Well, economists classify what you're talking about as the theory of the second best. If there are some things you'd like to do that you're not able to do, then that affects what you would like to do with everything else that you can do. That's the general theory of the second best. And all of that is true. If we are unable to have land value taxation, we might not want to do lots of other things that we would want to do if we could have land value taxation. But I would also say that there, there is a, a danger in operating the theory of the second best that you will rigidify the constraints. Instead of working to loosen the constraints, you will simply accept them. And I think it's important to maintain the effort to uh, get rid of the most important constraints with the, that do arise from the fact that some people have all the land. Just coming back to it, you, you can't, in Ireland we had a situation where the land was relatively speaking divided evenly. It doesn't work. Fully. Yeah. And, and that scenario actually can never happen because of the locational nature yeah, yeah, of land. No. Always land yes, I agree. I way. agree. It cannot be done. So you, you're, relying, you're relying on the land tax then in some way. You're yes. That will make, in, in the natural order of things, uh, produce the best layout. Well, it, it will produce the equivalent of equality. Equality. But at the same time, you're talking about personal ability to do what you want with your land. Yes. Unfortunately, people don't act entirely rationally in this way, and they certainly don't act in the best interest of everybody. Yes. And in that scenario, which we've experienced in Ireland, I can tell you, you get a situation where where most people suffer, even in the, the individual who thinks he's looking after his yeah. own interests. Yeah. Well, so I think there has to be a situation where, to a certain extent, people have to agree to limit their liberties, and it is not available not to do. Yeah. It's a small island. Yeah. We, we well, have difficulties with other communities on the same island. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've dealt with this. It simply has, has to be a situation that for a reasonable slices of the island, this small island, you have to be able to limit everybody for an optimum outcome. And yeah. the evidence is people are happier. Well, it is. Well, um, I, if you are right, then if you tried to do things my way, where some play, communities could do it one way and others could do it another way, nobody would want to live in the communities where there was more individual liberty. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to be proven wrong by the choices that people make. But I also want to emphasize my agreement with you that people should not be uh, permitted to impose costs on one another. It's very important to prevent that. And, but we, we just disagree on the best way to do that. You want to do it with planning, I want to do it with prices. Nick, okay, let, let's, we need to we, we, let other people talk. Peter. Nick, is what, is, you used the word monopoly. Yes, I said... Uh, what does that mean? I, I, okay. I, I end up... I, I yes, can't yeah. I, well, I, I can't I, sell it for whatever price yeah. I, I, no. I choose. Well, you, it's important to look at the historical use of the word monopoly, to understand that it had a widespread meaning in English hundreds of years before there were economists. Yes, it comes from the Greek words for uh, signal seller, but its meaning changed by the 1600s to be, well, I think the best example I can give is when I was a child, my father would say to my sisters and me, don't monopolize the bathroom. He wasn't saying, don't seek to become the sole seller of bathroom services. <laughs> He was saying, don't take more than your share. And when Henry George talked about land monopoly, he wasn't talking about one person owning all the land. He was talking about people having more than their share. And that is the sense in which I used uh, monopoly in the paper. And so what I'm saying is, if the majority says to the minority, you have to do things our way and you can't get out, they're exercising their control over more than their share of land 
There, it's an example of land monopoly. Yes. Well, can I just pick up yes. a minor point about the um, carbon emissions um, uh, and making China uh, pay mm -hmm. for carbon emissions? But they, America has exported its carbon emissions, hasn't it? Well, because it's nearly importing that. Yeah. So the, the, yes, the, the, the cost of, of China's carbon dioxide emissions will reflected the prices that U.S. consumers have to pay at Walmart for all the things they buy. Yes. So, yes, it, that, so yeah, it will work out. Yeah, yes, it, 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 it will work out through the market. Yes, yes, that's true. Okay. Yes. I suppose, uh, and I don't know if this is a European versus North American issue, but people just can't accept this absolute right of secession. Yeah. Uh, because of non-compensable harms, and I think that's where she's going. Because, uh -huh. because you have to deal with that through regulation somehow. Yeah. Because you can't deal with it in the price system. Well, like I want a regulation that says you can't start a nuclear plant. Yes. Right. Out. Okay. Well, I guess what I would say is that uh, when we are completely sure that no sane person would pay a cost equal to the harm that is done then of course it makes sense to prohibit something. And uh, we, the, the line of argument that you're starting there could end in world government. Now, some people might like world government. I, I find that a horror. Uh, I, I think that it's important to have independent sources of power and, I'm, uh, uh, and to try to regulate the harms that countries cause one another in some other way. So yes, it's true that uh, if you have secession of some kind, that it will create a, a possibility of uncompensated harms. But I would like to uh, deal with that by having some institution for generating compensation for the harms that would otherwise be uncompensated, rather than by preventing secession. Alana, now. Just, just to note that the capacity to put a, a postage stamp on an envelope and have it sent around the world is actually a form of world government. Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's a world government carried out by the International Postal Union, which, as I understand, is run out of a little brownstone in Geneva. They don't have any armies. That makes them a much safer world government. And I'd like to have that kind of world government. Uh, a, a world government where we agreed to abide by sensible rules that we worked out together and didn't have any armies to enforce them. That would be nice. Well, I will have one more thing then. Uh, on Saturday, we have a big event at the end of our tour, which is a speaker's corner at Hyde Park, and we're going to relaunch our International Declaration of Individual and Common Rights to Land, now we're calling it to Earth. Nick, have you recently read the IU's declaration that goes back to 1939? I just was wondering about your thoughts on it. Uh, I noticed that it was in my packet, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> okay. Well, we will hear from you on Saturday. Okay. Yes. Uh, one sentence of yours in my ear on my paper. <laughs> you said complete ownership in inventions is not an efficient tool. Yes. Um, so in Germany we have a discussion about if also intellectual property rights mm -hmm. are not some sort of land. Yes. Land. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, what your, do you have any conclusions? Yeah. Um, this also yeah, so, okay. My, my favorite institution for dealing with that is to uh, include a country's contribution to the world knowledge base as a credit against its appropriation of natural opportunities. So that any country that created stuff would get a return from the rest of the world for its value to the rest of the world and could pass that on to the inventors and we wouldn't have to have these monopolies. And open access though. Yes, open access. But with compensation for the creators of a reasonable sort. Yes. Are, are you serious about your ideas of communities seceding? Yes. If, if they don't like the particular rules of the community they're in? Yes. It just strikes me as somewhat impractical. Uh, I, you're suggesting they would have to physically move to another territory. Well, or could they stay where they are and be sort of something? Well, be, be, the trouble is that we ought to use all the land of the world for, for some purpose already. There shouldn't be any free land for another community to move to. So we, we, in the case of a disagreement, we have to divide things up. I mean, we had some examples of some relatively peaceful uh, secessions. Uh, well, 
Czechoslovakia was the most peaceful one. The South Sudan was eventually peaceful after a long war. The breakup of the Soviet Union was a reasonably peaceful separation into parts. Uh, I think that we should just come to an understanding that when people can't agree on the real rules under which they're going to live, they divide into separate communities. And they don't have to go anywhere. They, they should be able to go anywhere, somewhere else if they want to. But if there's no place else that they want to go, they should be able to stay in place and live under a separate set of rules. Nick, I, I have a real difficulty as does the previous question with that concept. I don't know whether it's something between America and, and Europe. Especially. No, everybody, everybody I talk to has different. Plymouth graduate went to America because they couldn't stand living under the British government. Yes. But there, there ain't any wilderness anymore. Right, right. And how far do you take this? If my village doesn't like the local uh, planning authority's ideas for what it should do in that area, it is simply not credible to succeed. Yeah. Not unless you've got a very powerful federated structure. Yeah. Which, um, well, you know, okay, that's it. Yeah, that, that's. Uh, every, everywhere I propose it, I, we were running out of time, so I'll, I'll answer you and, and, and finish. Everywhere I propose these ideas, people say I'm crazy for the same reason that you say. So it, it, you're not unusual in finding this an unacceptable part. All I'm saying is that if you believe in land as everybody's common heritage, you ought to recognize that in order for there to be everybody's common heritage, they have to have some rights to do what they want to do and not what else, somebody else thinks they ought to do, but I, we're really out of time, I, I got to let it go.